If you have your Bibles, we got to ask you to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse, Acts chapter 4, in the very first verse. And as they, meaning the apostles, and as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, bring, being grieved that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and the elders and scribes and Ananias the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before, the, before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For is, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I'd like to preach this morning, the Lord being my helper, on the, on the thought, time well spent. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you honor, Lord, that you've given us a place to meet this morning. We thank you for that. God, more than that, we praise you for the ones that set before us, Lord. We pray that we know that they came here by your divine appointment and accomplished it after your own will, and we give you praise for that. Lord, we pray this morning that you might even start a revival in our own hearts that would spread to this people, Lord God, that uh, people might know that uh, you are still uh, high, you're still lifted up, you're still above all, God, we praise you for that. Lord God, we pray this morning to meet with this thy people, and we be faithful to give you the praise and glory for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, we're uh, reading for some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, probably not as familiar as they should be. And what I have found among Baptists, and really among any uh, so-called church, is if it's not well understood, people avoid it, like the book of James. Uh, people don't like that because there's so much about works and, and where works belong. And, and I think James makes it uh, very clear if you don't have works, you're just not saved. And, and so a lot, of, a lot of this is apostolic teaching and people do not like it because they really don't understand the office of apostle and in and, and all truthfulness they don't understand the Holy Ghost even as he is today. Yeah. You know what? That's not a bad thing to say. That's a part of the triune God. The Holy Ghost is real and not only should we acknowledge that he's real, we should desire him because he was less left as a comforter for us yeah. and if you want to access God you'll have to access him via the Holy Ghost. That is what the Bible teaches. And so we find uh, that that's one reason some of these scriptures are uh, avoided in the modern day. Uh, so it begins and as they spake meaning the apostles, the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now there are five separate groups 
that were wanting to shut down what God was doing. You know what? Uh, by, by bulk majority today, people want to shut down what God is doing. If they possibly can, they, they, you know, in reality, if He's sovereign, they can't, but that certainly doesn't stop them from trying because the thing of it is, they don't understand He's sovereign. They, they think that they can interrupt the plan of God. And so I want you to see that a group of five different types of persons were all in one mind. We're going to shut them down. Now, uh, we live in a day and age today like that where people want to shut God's people down. And I want you to notice that at least three of these were religious groups. They, they were so-called God's people. And they wanted to shut the truth down. You know what? If God gets in and among His people, you can look out because Satan is on his way and Satan always manifests himself among people. Uh, that He uses the means that are available to him and that's, uh, and that's what he'll try to do. And as they spake, the people, the priest, and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, I want you to see particularly the Sadducees was upset because they believed there were no resurrection of the dead. And you know what? Uh, separate and apart of the goodness of God, if I didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, I'd just live like a dog because when this was over, that was it, right? Uh, so why not have a good time while you're doing it? But be it known this morning that there is a, a resurrection of the dead. And in fact, in Revelation, it says there will be a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. And you know what? That's two resurrections. A lot of people want to deny that today. But you know what? That has to seem to me that there's two different ones if they're, if, they're, if they're mentioned in separate places. The resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. Now, what I have found, the reason people don't like that is that it makes you accountable to God after you're dead. You're accountable to God. Uh, everything that you do, you're accountable to God and you'll deal with Him on those things. Verse 3, And they, meaning this whole group, very group of people, and they laid hands on them and put them in, in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Now, I want you to see that they're arrested and put into jail. Now, um, have you ever thought about if, uh, if Christianity became illegal, would you be arrested? Would they find enough on you to say, yeah, he's guilty? Because see, the thing, the thing of it is, if you don't have behaviors and you don't have uh, uh, and, and, and you don't come to the house of God and you have no habits that depict you as a Christian, you know what? You won't be found guilty. But these men, in addition to being, they wanted them shut down, they was arrested for their beliefs. You know what? It would be a good thing this morning. Donna has a book right now she's reading, and I hope to get to uh, read it after she's done, about the underground church in China. You know what? The, if we had a, if our freedoms were so compacted that we had to meet in secret, maybe God would begin to move. See, we, we, we have, we're, we're too fortunate in the nation that we live and we pretty much can do what we please. But I want you to see it's always been a method of the devil to, to shut people down. Alright, despite them being arrested, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed and the number of men, the number of men was about 5,000. Now, the reason that that's significant is because, remember, uh, on the, the miracle of the five loaves and two fishes, he, it said that they fed 5,000 beside women and children. In that day, the men were counted, the women were not. Uh, uh, the, the, first, uh, the first five senses of the United States of America, the men were counted and the women were not. Did you know that? They were counted, but they weren't given their names. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, you can think about a revival that was quite incredible on, the, on this occasion 
and they were already locked up. The best I understood, they were locked up and then they were saved. You know what? It might be a good visual thing for one of us to get locked up and, and, and just have to suffer maybe just a tiny little bit for the things of the Lord Jesus Christ because uh, I don't think we experience enough of that uh, in the modern day. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas the, and John and Alexander and as many were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Again, I want you to see a very, very group all in unison to shut God's people down. That's always been an effort and it still is today. Verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, they wasn't talking about power as in strength. They, they were talking about uh, governmental power. So, who gave you permission to do this? You know what? We don't need permission from anybody. If I want to preach the gospel, I don't need any permission from anyone. That's why I have a little issue with a license to preach. I don't want one. And you know why? Nobody, nobody's, nobody except for the church has given me authorization to preach, nor do I need it. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I've told you about this before. Wayne Adams up in Louisville. They got this, in the city of Louisville, they got this big idea about the, 25 years ago, all the preachers was going to get a license. And they was going to take the money and give it to hungry children and all those group huggy things that they do. Sounds wonderful, don't it? You know what Wayne said? I don't need a license to preach, nor will I get one. And you know what? He spent about six weeks in jail because of it. See, uh, again, we as the Lord's people, we've had it a good way too long. But you know what happened out of that? Many people listened. Many people, uh, uh, many, many, the Lord used it in a great way. So they put him in the midst and said, I want to know why you're doing this. Verse 8, Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to see that it is, uh, it, it is noteworthy here. When did the Holy Ghost come down? Chapter 2. And in that instance, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake uh, with other tongues. Right? Here it says that Peter, individually, one person, Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. Right? That's what it says, you know. And, and, and it gave him the ability to speak. It gave him the ability to be bold. When otherwise, you know, Peter wasn't a bold man. If you don't believe that, he denied the name of Christ three separate times on one night. And, and what made him bold was the power of the Holy Ghost. And you know what's going to make you bold? If you're going to be able to tell people of the goodness of God, it will be if you're full of the Holy Ghost. And listen, if you can be full of the Holy Ghost, you can be empty of Him too. And the reason I know is I've experienced being empty and it's not a pleasant place to be. And you know what's going to empty you out? Sin. <laughs> Sin is going to empty you out, and, and you're going to be left barren. Uh, now, remember what I'm saying. I don't mean you're going to be left lost, but you're going to let, be left barren and empty because of the lack of the Holy Ghost. And so I want you to see that P Peter really went after them. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, saying to them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if, you be, if we this day be examined of the good deed to the impotent man, or the powerless man, or the man that's unable to walk, and by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, unto all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand, be here before, uh, before you whole. 
Now, I'll give you a couple of ideas about this, a couple of reminiscence. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. So he did it in the name of Jesus, didn't he? You know what? Uh, you look at this bunch over here uh, up in uh, Kentucky. And uh, they try to tell you that Jesus wasn't his name. You know what? According to this, Jesus is a powerful name, is it not? Mm -hmm. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over here in Paris, they're doing the same thing, ain't they, brother? See, uh, it's in the power of Jesus. Uh, I hope I never get to the point where I'm ashamed of that name. I'll just keep saying it, won't you? And then on another instance, a little further down the road in history, I think it's about Acts 15, says that Paul was wearied by the woman who was possessed. And he turns around and says, In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. See again, in the name of Jesus. Very critical, very important, isn't it? You know what? That's a powerful name. That's why uh, people with one eye and, and, and have sense, you know what? I would never, ever name a person Jesus because it's belittling to the name of Jesus. But you know, in Mexico, you can't throw a rock without hitting a Jesus on the head with it. Because that's their version of Jesus. And you know what it shows? It shows a lack of respect for the name of Jesus. And you know what will come to this country? The very same thing. Lack of respect. Because you know what? Irregardless of what people think, uh, that, that's not a loved name anymore. And so we find here then that there's very much a powerfulness, a power that can be accessed and a power that can, can, can be authenticated through the name of Jesus. Verse 11, this is the stone which... Uh, was said at naught or made nothing or deemed nothing of you, uh, of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given unto men whereby we must be saved. So if you're saved it'll be through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved Jesus is the answer. If you're saved, you did not trust baptism. You did not trust receiving the Holy Ghost. You did not trust any of these other things. It came through Jesus. And you know why? He was the perpetual sacrifice. He was the complete sacrifice. There's salvation in no other name but the name Jesus Christ. That needs to be etched on our hearts, doesn't it? That way we can share it with people. And, and so then we, uh, as Peter is answering these questions, notice what he says in verse 13. Now when, and that means the enemy group, when they, the enemy group, saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now this is not the message, but I, I just want you to think for a minute. How long has it been since you've been bold? <laughs> How long has it been since you really stood for the name of Christ? In a group of people where maybe you was the only one, would you be willing to say, be it known unto you? When, you were among, when you're among a group where you stick out like a sore thumb, are you going to be bold? Are you going to be, are you going to be encouraged? See, we ought to be. And, and, and in spite, and it was just the two of them, in spite of being outnumbered by a great deal, I want you to see that they were still bold in what they had to do. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them. Now, get that. That they had been with Jesus. Now, by looking and hearing what you speak, can they take knowledge that you've been with Jesus? See, uh, salvation then is pretty easy to pick up on, is it not? They took knowledge that they'd been with Jesus. Uh, that's why 
uh, as Paul is writing to the Galatian church, he said, by their fruits you will know them. In other words, I do not have to be shocked. You know what? If some, unless they're just ignorant and never have, have been discipled, if people look lost and act lost, the conclusion that I come to is that they're still lost. If they don't have a desire to be down at the house of God, something's horribly wrong. If they don't cherish that word that you have in your life this morning, something's terribly, terribly wrong. And why should we paint it any other thing? Um, uh, if you crave the things of this world, something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong. And so then we as the Lord's people, we ought to be the ones this morning that are able uh, to, to uh, know that time spent with Jesus is time well spent. Uh, have, you, have you ever wondered if you're spending your time well? That you're doing things that are appropriate? Go with me back to uh, Psalms chapter 90. I read it in your presence very many times over the years. But I want to I wanna look at it again. Psalms 90. And we're just going to read verses 13. Uh, I mean, excuse me, verse 9 through 12. Uh, Psalms 90, beginning in verse 9. For our days are passed away in thy wrath. Now we know Moses was a, well, was a saved man and he was a man that lived the majority of his life in, in, in God's will. But he, he makes the note here that our days are spent in wrath. And if you don't believe that, look at how difficult each day is. You know, I, I ain't quite 50 yet. And, and some morning when I wake up, I do not want to get out of the bed. I know I have to. I've got a family. I've got kids to raise still. But it would sure feel good if I could just lay in that bed. And you know what? <laughs> you know why I have to? The wrath of God on this earth. Because it doesn't bring forth like it should. And so as long as I live, I'll still have to hit the pavement, right? Yeah. So even the very best of the persons, we live under the wrath of God because the earth is cursed. The, the earth is cursed by what Adam and Eve did in the garden. And so as Moses is writing this out, he says, uh, For all our days are passed away in wrath, we spend our years as a tale that is told. Now, uh, what, he, what he's saying about that is this. They're going to be talking about you when you're gone. Now, what are they going to say about you? What do you want to be said about you? You know what? Uh, do I want them to say, man, he was a crackerjack nurse. He knew his stuff. Not necessarily a bad thing. But that's not really much to be said, is it? I've known lots of good nurses. I've known lots of good nurses and better nurses than me. So that's really not a whole lot to be said, is it? Man, he sure left a pile of money for them youngins, didn't he? That's not going to be said. But, um, you see what I'm saying. That, that, that's not a whole lot to be said. You know, you know what? If you leave a pile of money to your youngins, what's going to happen? They're going to run through it. And I, that's, about, that's about the extent of it, right? So, what will be said about you? You know, uh, huh, uh, I've often said when, when I joined the others out here in the yard beside the church, all I really, uh, that, that would be noteworthy to put on my headstone is this, only a sinner saved by grace. That would really sum it up, would it not? That's the entirety of my life. The whole tale told would be a sinner saved by grace that would wrap up the entirety of Larry Lafferty if I lived to be 90 years old. It would all be wrapped up in those three words, right? 
And so as, uh, as, uh, as Moses is writing here, he begins to make us understand that time well spent is whatever we do for the Lord. Whatever is spent in His efforts. Whatever is spent us doing what He would have us to do. Verse 10, the days of our years are three score years and ten or seventy. And if by reason of strength they be four score years or eighty, yet it is their, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Strength, labor, and sorrow. You know what? Uh, <laughs> Everybody might say Moses was a Debbie Downer, right? But he pretty much had it summed up, didn't he? Uh, still working. <laughs> you know what? Right up to the day that Moses was taken, and uh, God took him, and he died, and God buried him up on the mountain somewhere, he was still leading a rebellious people. Even to the day before he died. Right? Still doing what, what God called him to do. He said, go take the promised land. And he was still trying on the day that he died, still doing what God had called him to do. Verse 11. Who knoweth, who knoweth the power of thine anger? And I can answer that, those that have experienced it. Even according to fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now, he sums it up and says, uh, teach us to number our days, make them precious, this, make this day significant that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Now, wisdom and knowledge is two different things. You know what? Uh, I can tell you knowledge is this, Christ is coming. Wisdom is how you use that. Knowledge is that the Lord said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now you know that there is a church and that Christ did build it. Wisdom is what you're going to do with it. Your life is short. The wisdom is what you're going to do with it. The knowledge is life is not... It, it passes very quickly. But the wisdom is, what are you going to do with your life? What, what, what's it going to amount to? What are the individual ideas? What are the individual things that you, that you might accomplish in the time that, that the Lord has given you? It ought to be time well spent. It ought to be time given to things. Now, uh, I'll give you a couple of things on this. And the first one is this. I understand the weariness of the flesh. You know, even the Lord Jesus Christ got tired at times. Do not? The Bible has, has that well documented. He was sleeping on a boat, wasn't he? You know why? Because he was tired. He preached all day. He was wore out. But, don't use that as an excuse. We all like our downtime, don't we? That's fine. Everybody has to unplug, I suppose. Don't use it as an excuse. Right? Don't use it as an excuse. So, uh, this amount of time, whatever it may be, uh, I'll tell you the best time spent is the time that you spend with Jesus. The time that you spend in, around, in and around His Word. The time that you spend with the Lord's people. Listen, that's time well, well spent. That's time that you can do, uh, do something good with is the time that you spend with the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be our priority. That should be... What, what, what our chief desire is. And I, I feel like if we're in the, the will of the Lord that in fact that is the case. Now, um, go with me to 2 Samuel. And I'm going to give you a couple of warnings about wasting time. 2 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11. Very familiar verses of Scripture. 
in the very first verse. 2 Samuel 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired. Now, a lot of people run through this and, and don't really catch everything that's in there. But what does it mean to expire? It means it's gone. When, when uh, in, in nursing, you know, we don't see, say people died. Uh, we say they expired. That means their time ran out, right? It's literally what it means. And, and, and so, uh, uh, what had happened in David's life was another year was gone. The, the time had expired. And you know what? Tonight, when I get ready to go to, to bed and I stretch out, I usually go to bed about 10 or 11. And when I stretch out on that bed, another day has expired. It's gone. It can't be brought back. And there's nothing to be done with it. So the question is this, what have you done with the time that the Lord Jesus Christ gave you? Uh, that's why, you know what the Bible says, uh, as John was out on the Isle of Patmos, no matter what seventh day people say, you know what he said? He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. On the day meant for Jesus Christ. On the day set aside for Him, not Jehovah God, not the Sabbath, but on, on the Lord's day, He was in the Spirit. You know what? That's all day long. You know, uh, uh, I thank the Lord for this church because we, we meet a long time on Sunday. Don't, don't get me wrong. I get wore out too. But you know what? This day belongs to Him anyway. It's not right. yours. It's not yours. So why don't you give it to Him? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And, and, and so we find here that, that David had gone a whole other year of his life had elapsed. A whole other year was gone. And what had he done for the cause of Christ? How much time had he wasted? And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Now David was a king, and David's job was to go to battle. In fact, he said, the sword will never depart from your house. And some, of the, some people look at that as curse, but it was his job. He was king. My job, firstly, because the person that doesn't do this is worse than the infidel, uh, my first job is to provide for these three young ladies. That's what I am to do. Whatever means I can accomplish that, that's my job. Then, closely intertwined with that, and when you're a preacher, it is very intertwined. I spend my time, what I'm supposed to be doing, is preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, <laughs> I committed my life to that a long, long, long time ago. That is what I am supposed to be doing. I don't need to be at the house all the time. I don't need to be on a creek bank somewhere fishing. I don't need to be on the lake shore somewhere. What I need to be doing is be about my father's business. And see, David's issue, and when all this came up, is David was not where he's supposed to be. And, and when we don't go to the house of the Lord, and we do stay at home, and we avoid being around the Lord's people, what the end result is, is that we get into trouble. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab unto him, and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Amnon, and besieged Rabah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem, and it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed. Problem number two. <coughs> He's sleeping all day and up all night. You know what? I don't care what anybody has to say. That's a problem. I, listen, as a nurse, I understand some people have to work nights. But you know what? Generally, we need to be... You know, the Lord even said, <laughs> are there not 12 hours in the day? See, uh, daylight hours, He wants us to use them for the Lord. He wants to use... See, if not only had David been where he needed to be, this thing with Bathsheba had not come, and even if he was home, 
by that late in the night, because a woman did this procedure at way past sundown. If he had worked all day and been tired, he'd been asleep by the time this came on, but he laid in the bed all day. Now he was up at night. You know what? We need to be very careful about stuff like that because a <laughs> good time to see stuff that you better not have, you'd have been better not have ever seen. And it came to pass at eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked about the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and she, the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired of the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned into her house. And so all that sin came, came about by David not using his time. See, you're given this time, this time that ought to be well spent, and oftentimes we waste it, and we do things that are not pleasing unto the Lord. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a sad, sad thing to live about 80 years and wake up one day and realize you've wasted the majority of your time. See, we are to be about the Father's business. We are to give Him praise and lift Him up and glorify Him every day that we live, every, every opportunity that we have. Otherwise, we might, uh, we might end up like He did. Go with me to Judges. Judges 19. Judges 19, we're going to begin reading in verse 4. Judges 19, beginning in verse 4, the Bible says, And his, and this meaning uh, the young man that came from Ephraim, and his father and his father-in-law, the damsel father, retained him, and he abode with him three days, so they did eat and drink and lodge there. Now, if you know the story, this man had married a woman, and she ran back to father's house. <laughs> and if you read your Bible, it said after some time, then he went and got her. You know what? Uh, first of all, boys, men, keep your house in order. You know what? Unless she's out birthing a baby somewhere, or maybe somebody's in the hospital, I know about it. At bedtime, I want to know where Donna is. And you know what? Just for so, and she ought to know where I, I ought to want to know where I'm at. But this man did not run a very strong house, so after some time, then he went to his father's house, and instead of going in and saying, hey, you're coming home with me, it's time to get back to the house, he tarried even longer, and, and tarried with the heathens. You know what? It's wasted time, the time that you give to heathen practices. The time that you give to just wasting uh, uh, in the worldliness that surrounds us today, that's just wasted time. And so what this man had done is wasted time. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, and he rose to depart, the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a, with a morsel of bread, and afterward go on your way. Now I want you to see the emphasis of this man was delaying him one day at a time. Now, what the devil will do to you, he's not going to say, Adam, uh, you're young, you can blow off the next 20 years and you'll still only be in your 40s. That, that'll be good. He's going to do it like this, Jared. It's hot today. It's a Tennessee hot day. Stay at the house. He's going to say the next day, Matthew, you've been working on that house too much. It's time for a day just to hang out. One day at a time. And then you wake up and you've wasted 10, 15, 20 years on things that really don't matter all that much, right? One day at a time. And this man's father-in-law was very, a very evil man, and, and, and he did just that. One day, one time, one thing at a time. 
Verse 6, And they sat down and did eat and drink, and both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content. <laughs> if you underline in your Bible, put that underline. Be content, I pray thee. Tarry all night, and let thy heart be merry. What a wonderful, wonderful invitation. And you know what? <laughs> it sounds good to the flesh, don't it? Let's just hang out, have a big time. But this is the thing. This life is not about entertainment. Now that's what the devil wants you to believe. But this life is not about having a big time. What it's about is serving God. What it's about is spreading the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this day is about. And it will very quickly, quickly, quickly be gone. And so we, we as the Lord's people, we need to focus in on spreading the gospel. Now, if you know the rest of the story, what happens as they, they head out on the lake trip. Remember the story? You know what? When it's late in our day here on earth, say what, we're in our 60s, you start out then, you're probably going to have problems. Now this man and his wife started out late, late. And when they got to the first city, nobody would take them in. Now, had they prepared and had they had started out early, you know what they could have done? They could have went to the next city. But because they were foolish and they did not plan, uh, they, they ended up being trapped out. Finally got into one individual's house and he threw his wife out because the men were so rough. And they killed her in a very horrific way. Ended up keep cutting his own wife up into 12 pieces as a testimony against Israel. See, that wasn't his plan when he left, was it? But it happened. And you know why? Because he wasted time. He wasted time. Listen, church, time is precious. Time is very, very precious. We need to use each day as the gift that it is and try to share it with others. Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I'll begin reading in verse 48. Luke chapter 2 and verse 48. 48, and when they, meaning Mary and Joseph, and when they saw him, they were amazed. And said, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, you can imagine parents, and, and, and sometimes, uh, as you'll see from this instance, things begin to get kind of dim and it may not be as quite as defined as we like it to be. Um, their 12-year-old boy was missing. Now, if you follow that, they thought that he was with some of the other family. That'd be like, say, we all went over to the, to the, the Ark up in East Kentucky and we're coming back and I thought Bella was with Adam and Sarah. And we got about halfway home and Adam says, Dad, I didn't see Bella. You can imagine the, the, the panic. And uh, that's where they were. The only difference was Jesus was a little older. He was 12. And so they went rushing back. And you know what? They just said, why are you doing this? The, 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 they were upset. They were, they were just as angry as if you had been if your child was missing and you get there and everything's fine and, and immediately you want to go, what are you doing? You know what people are going to react to you when you put Jesus first? What are you doing? Don't you know you've got your whole life before you? Don't you know what comes first? Don't you know that money's important? Don't you know that family has to come first? Right. You know, somebody told me one time, family's, family comes first. And I looked at them and I said, no, they don't. And they looked at me like I had six heads. 
But you know what? <laughs> That's why He said, forsaking father and mother and sister and brethren. And because Jesus comes first. So the Lord Jesus Christ, as difficult as it was, He was in the right. <coughs> he, 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 he did exactly as He was supposed to. Verse 49, And He said unto them, How is it that you sought Me? Wished you know that I must be about My Father's business. And you know what? The reason He said this, You know why I came. You know why I'm here. You know I was of a virgin birth. Joseph, you know you're not my real daddy. You know. You know what? When you know something, you become accountable for it, don't you? If you know Christ is on the throne, you're accountable for it. If you know that life is short, you're accountable for it. You know, I think uh, I think that's going to be the most sad part of judgment is those years when he says, "Boy, what were you doing through here?" I can, and, and not to mention how how weak at times I've served him, but I can tell you from twelve to eighteen, I'm in trouble because you know why? That there's no excuse. I can say, well, "I didn't know. Nobody ever taught me." And he'll say to me, we well, had a Bible, didn't you? You know, that, that's going to be one thing that he's going to have America head over barrel, ain't he? You had the Word. That's right. You had the Word. And, and, and so we, we then as Lord's people, we, we can't use ignorance as an excuse. So we might, and, and I'll give you, a, parents, let me give you this. That teaches us whatever the Lord wants with them, you give into it, and you give you give a high hand of praise if they're called, because it's 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 a wonderful, wonderful thing. The last place I want to read: Gospel of John, chapter eleven. John eleven, and I'll begin reading in verse eight. John eleven, verse eight. The Bible says, "And his disciples said unto him, Master." The Jews of late sought to stone thee. Why goest thou thither again? Now I want you to see in verse 8, a thing that's very natural to mankind comes out in his disciples, and that is natural preservation. We have an inbuilt desire to preserve self. I, I, was reading, I, I was listening to this thing on the internet the other day. And it was about uh, a young family. There was four children, and mom and daddy were both not at home, and the house caught on fire. And an older sister laid over a younger sister and preserved her life. The, the older girl died, but her sister protected her from the heat, and she lived. Now, uh, when fire, when somebody said, fire! Every one of us would be hitting the door. Those of us that's got sense would be grabbing our babies, but we'd have them on our hips and we'd be running, right? Would anybody, you know, uh, if you knew somebody was heading into a fire, our natural impulse is to stop them, right? Mm -hmm. But they need to go where God's told them to go. They need to be led and they need to be moved. And if God says you go to the hot spot, you know what you need to do? You need to get in the hottest part of the hot spot and just be where God would have you to be. And, 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 and so we find here that they said, Listen, Jesus, don't you know they're about ready to take you down? Uh, when, when, you, when you show up, don't you know they're going to knock you in the head? Don't you know it's going to be a problem? Verse 9, And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? Now, he's talking 6A to 6P. Are there not 12 hours in a day? we got to answer that, yes. And if you live, uh, if you live in, along the, uh, above the equator like we do, you know what? It's more than that. Right now, daylight hours are running from about right around 5.30 or 6. 
to 8 o'clock at night. That's a lot of hours. That's a lot of hours. So he says, oh, they're not 12 hours of the day? Sure they are. <laughs> and so he says, well, yes, they are. So I'm going to the hot spot. I'm going to spend the time that I have usefully. I'm going to spend the time that I have uh, to mean something for the cause of Christ. I'm going, to, I, I'm going to take this gift of time that He's given me and do something noteworthy with it. And Jesus answered and said, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Now that gets us back kind of where we started. Safe folks act like safe folks. And lost folks act like lost folks. So what are you doing with your time? What, it, what, what, what is the thing that's priority to you? Uh, when it's all said and done, what's going to matter? This stuff doesn't last very long, you know. Addy, I tell you about this, you grandma want Judy. When she died in the nursing home, I took everything she had out in a pasteboard box. That taught me a whole lot about life. Didn't want to lose my sister at all, but man, you talk about a lesson. And you know what? She's laid out over here in England, just like everybody else. She's carried out to the cemetery, just like everybody else. We laid her to rest, just like everybody else. So what she had really didn't matter, did it? All right. That's exactly right. It really didn't matter. So what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? And when you stand for the life, Lord, and you are kind how you gonna answer? Very, very unlit thought is 